So I'm going to come at it the opposite way and say, where are you at risk? most with your, the mental state you want, what is the thing that you need to take affirmative action towards? Because if anything's going to pull you down, it's going to be X. Oh yes. So good, Kevin. That's such a good question for me. And I just had awareness around this during the holidays. I have recognized you're a hundred percent right. I never have a problem with motivation. I actually have like this internal motor that sometimes I'm like, Jesus, like, can we, I, I don't need to be doing, doing, doing Yeah. where I can falter is when I'm, you know, the holidays, we're so busy. We're here, there I'm cooking. I'm at this person's house. And even though it's all positive and fun and amazing, it's overwhelming in a way, right? And that has happened to me all throughout my career too. Like if there's a show coming up and I'm in rehearsal, I'm in this, I often can get overwhelmed. And then what happens is then my body's like, okay, we're gonna get you like under the weather. So you take a moment to stop. All right, Renee, well, we're going to get behind the scenes with you now. I like that. You know that behind the scenes off stage. This part, is, uh, the yeah, part. the good, this is the, I was going to say the green room. I guess not. This is like behind yeah. the curtain, right? Yeah, this is yeah. the real stuff. All right. Well, we're going to walk down through these and, uh, you know, it's been fun getting to know you in a lot of these. I've got a little context, uh, but, uh, some, I don't know. So this will be a good, uh, a good time to get to know each other better. Spiritual. Tell me about that aspect of your life. Now, I know you came, you said you came a, a Italian American family growing yeah. up in New Jersey. And it's interesting that maybe I'm swayed by the stuff I've seen on screen, but I yeah. look at it as spirituality. It's, it's interconnected to everything there. So tell me about that area of your life, the values and what you do to practice those. Well, I grew up as, as you said, in a close knit Italian American family and from kindergarten through eighth grade, I attended a Catholic school. So at that time, I was going to church and um, really listening to those to those Catholic values. And now, as as I've grown and traveled the world and been exposed to so many different cultures and beliefs, I really consider myself more of a spiritual being. I believe in God. I pray every day. Um, I meditate. So I study transcendental meditation which has been absolutely incredible. I learned it, my husband and I, when we lived in Los Angeles. And I just, I love it. I love it so much. Um, so my spirituality is so, so important to me. I mean, it really is, when I think of habits or how I start my day, spirituality is number one, first and foremost. It's interesting, transcendental meditation. Most people have heard that term. It's come to light for me because a few months ago, I had Melody Beattie on the show, the renowned author of Codependent No More that is just revised. But what stuck out, she's 74 or something, if I can remember that. And she says, oh my gosh, I've just gotten into, or it, was, or it was pretty recently, yeah. Transcendental Meditation, she said, changed my life. And I'm thinking, okay, if one of the authors of self-help themselves has now yeah. just gotten into this and says it changed her life, I need to check it out because- it is one of the greater struggles. If I look at my overall health and wellness, one of the things that I have had multiple providers say I need to do is spend some more time meditating, not just quiet and solitude. I do that well, but yep, actual yep. meditating, man, I don't want to go there. It's so difficult to just be and not do. Tell me, I know it, my friend, I'm, my mind's always going a million miles an hour thinking yep. all the thoughts, but what what has been eye opening for me is when I first started meditating. I mean, I've I've meditated for years and years. I believed, like many of you, that meditation is like quieting your mind of any and all thoughts, not thinking about anything. And it's like, no, oh, no, <laughs> how the, not thinking about anything it's just it, it drug me exactly. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, this is not humanly possible, or at least yeah. for me. But once I studied transcendental meditation, um my, you know, the amazing practitioners who taught me and they helped me to understand that it's not quieting your mind, but it's bearing witness to the thoughts and really sitting, oh. sitting back a little bit to be like, wow, look at that crazy thing. I just thought, oh, there I go again, judging myself. It's been such a, a, a mind shift for me. So I really enjoy it because the pressure's off. And to tell you a little bit more about me, I lived most of my life as 
a perfectionist from the time I was a little girl and then being a professional performer, just do it again, do it again. Perfect. It has to be right. So I, I lived a lot of my life in that space. So to have the permission to just be and not have to think something perfectly or and just bear witness was like, oh man, this feels good. <laughs> I've not heard that. I mean, I know that terminology, bear witness, but not in terms of meditating, bearing witness to the thoughts. So that's what you just not just quieting the mind. Yeah. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. That that feels more relatable than yeah, the concept of just don't yeah. think of anything. I just focus on your heartbeat and I just to not be distracted. That's almost <laughs> like I need a focal point. To yes. Do it. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, okay. if you tell me to just listen to my heartbeat, that's causing me anxiety. No so doubt. he's just doing the opposite. No doubt. And I can't, yeah. nothing's that quiet. I can still hear a fly fart somewhere yes. and it's going to distract me. <laughs> All right. Okay. The next one is, is relationships. Well, which is, I mean, we're on your, we're in your alleyway right here now. Um, I mean, that's the focus of the book, becoming a master communicator. As we talked about in part one, the point of there is to connect. So, but just to back up relationships. So as you step back and you look at your own relationships, what would you say is a highlight value? What do you value? What are you looking for? Oof. Listening. That hmm. component that, that I stressed a lot in, in our first interview, being a complete listener and surrounding myself with those who are complete listeners because I really believe listening is also a lost art, but it's also a two-way gift. And when you are a complete listener, you give that person who's speaking an open platform to be heard while you yourself gain the gift of learning something new, potentially gaining a new perspective, or most beautifully, realizing we are more alike than we are different. And I like to surround myself. I, I, I just said this. I forget where I just said this, but I was like, if you have people in your life who listen in that way, hold those people and hold them close. Because again, it's not about perfection. It's about connection. It's not that in my relationships, we're always going to get along perfectly, but you better believe if we're not getting along, we're going to have the wherewithal to listen to each other and then communicate about it and get back on track. So being a complete listener, surrounding myself with those good people. And also second case in point, my relationships are not just the ones that I've been brought up around my family, but my chosen family. My oh, chosen wow. family is so precious to me because those are the ones I got to handpick, right? The ones who I got to say, wow, I'm bringing you into my life because you you and I connect on such a level that we must be a part of each other's lives. That's interesting. I tease some of my kids. So I've got you know biological kids and I've got adopted ones and I tease the biological ones. Yeah, We didn't really pick you guys. We didn't know what yeah. we were getting. The yeah. adopted ones, we actually wanted them. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah, the chosen. Well, chosen. So what does that look like though on a... You know, weekly basis or, or whatnot, as far as we talked about in the first show too, to have these connection points mm -hmm. takes more than just the convenient yes. communications. It takes deeper. So it's an investment. So how does that look like for you? I'll give you a great example. So my dear friend, Kendra and I, she, uh, she's like beautiful soul sister. We met in Los Angeles. She actually was one of my first makeup artists out there. And I tell you, Kevin, when we first met, it was like instant. She's doing my makeup within like 10 minutes. We were like, I love you. I love mm. you. Like you're a soul sister from then on. And that, that was probably like 2014. We became great friends. So now she's in LA. I'm here in New Jersey, but I have my uh, email list, you know, my beautiful community. I send my emails out every Monday and she is like always the person to respond right back. I'm so proud of you. And we'll, we'll have a convenient interaction, but there's always, it, it happens naturally. There's always a period where, okay, enough with the digital communication. This happened last week. I said, Kendra, I shot her a text message uh, and actually didn't even text her. I voice memoed her. I said, Kendra, happy new year. I love you. Let's book a time to have a call. Like I need to hear from you. 
And that's what it is, Kevin. It's just really thinking of it like you think of anything else in your life that matters. You create a habit around it. And for me, my friendships, my relationships, it's about creating those habits of connection. Uh, It's not always successful, right? Sometimes you're like, we've gone way too long. But just like anything, if you have the awareness that, oh, you've been lacking a bit in that area, that's when it's a sure sign for me to say, okay, let's book a time, either hop on a Zoom, pick up the phone, or if we can meet for lunch, let's do it. Okay, so I'm curious around the aspect of listening, being a complete listener. Okay, so this is your area of expertise. You train and teach this. Yeah. And of course, work to practice what you preach yes. in your own life. So you know that. So if we're going to be in a relationship, I know that you're thinking about that with me. I know that you're thinking about that when you're with somebody else about being a listener. But now when we get to the more intimate, uh, longstanding relationships in your life, and I'm honestly thinking about, again, I just had Nedra glover Twab on the show as a therapist. Yeah. Her first big book was on boundaries. It was Set Boundaries, Find Peace. Is there, or do you take space sometimes to say, Hey, whoever this is, I care about you enough that if we are going to relate, I need this from you. I could maybe use some more listening from you. Tell me about that. If that takes place. 1 million percent. Yes. It's so it's, it's a two way street and, and we can never forget that, right? Any important relationship in our lives it's a two-way street. And that means that when you're aware, right, when you have that strong communication with yourself and you realize, sometimes it's even realizing that you need space. You know, Kevin, you and I talked last time and you explained how you're a a, a processor who kind of needs to go off, think about it, write about it. If you know you need that, well, that's your responsibility as the person in this relationship to let that person you care about know that because by let's say your wife right by your wife understanding this now she's not ruminating and and going into what i call in the book the three act play which refers to the mental ruminations of us being like well why is kevin not talking to me i mean did i do something what's the matter i mean what's the problem and we start to create stories in our own heads by you giving her this information listen, sweetheart, I just need a little bit of time. I'm trying to process things. Now she has the clarity to say, cool, I could step back. He'll talk to me when he's ready. And then there's no middle ground or gray room for miscommunication. Yes. I'm going to nod my head. It's been a long time coming, Renee, honestly, It, it, it me not being aware of and confident in and comfortable in my own needs in that way. Mm -hmm. And then I haven't communicated them well. And so in the, you know, back to the, you know, communication home, it's getting tense. I just want to avoid it. I'm gone. And so it's a withdrawal. We know that doesn't work in relationships. And yet it was, it was basically out of a lack of understanding back to the personal audit. I did not know myself. So, you know, again, I don't know if we really expounded about on this enough in the first show, but a prerequisite of this, of being a master communicator has got to start with, yeah, that personal awareness. You did talk about it a little bit, but I'm just going to bring it up, the personal awareness, because even though I think I have been a good communicator in the past, especially in the more intimate relationships, it's not been as masterful because yes. of the, my lack of self-awareness. Honestly. Yes. For yeah. all of us though, right? Again, and, and that's that's what I want everyone to understand is that we all fall into this. I mean, we are such complex beings. Let me tell you, get real transparent here. I've been speaking to... um an amazing woman who does inner child work. So I've been working with my inner children. Talk about communicating with self. Like, like I'm like, Oh, there's that little voice. That's always judging me. Why is she always judging me? You know, Mm. like that, that voice that always comes in is like, see Renee, there you go again. You made a mistake. And, and not just allowing that voice to speak, but sitting back and, and bearing witness like in meditation and then going like, well, where did that come from? Then tracing the steps back to my childhood, right? Yeah, to yeah. things that happened in, in my life and being like, oh, I thought at one point in my life that that was doing something to help me. Now I realize it's not helping me anymore. So we are so complex. We must 
must take that time to sit with ourselves. Think of your inner being. I, I like to say um, it's the quiet voice of your soul. The soul is the truest part of yourself. And most of us don't ever tap into it. Why? Because we have that other loud voice mm -hmm. of our ego, that loud voice, as I just shared, judging us. Oh, my God, Kevin, who are you? Nobody wants to hear you talk. Are you kidding me? You sound so stupid. Oh, my God, you're not good enough. That loud voice, which is not the truest part of ourself, it's so loud that it often drowns out that quiet, confident voice that's always there for us. You may call it your intuition. You may call it your gut instincts. Whatever you refer to it, it's that truest part of you that's always guiding you in the right direction. But if you can't hear it, how could you listen to it? And that's why training ourselves, getting into a habit of practicing communication with self allows that loud voice to quiet a little bit more so then you can be in tune to that quiet voice. It's like the the story I shared with you about how I spoke up for myself um, for the Jersey Boys role, the movie role. Right. I like to say that if I didn't have strong communication with myself, Kevin, I wouldn't have heard that little voice in the room telling me, you have to do this. It feels too right. I wouldn't have heard it. And so often I know this because so many other times in my life, I didn't hear that voice. And we all fall into this trap where then we go down a path where we're like, oh my God, how did I get here? Now I'm fighting with my husband or I'm fighting with, with my wife because we didn't have that, that um, moment of sitting back and taking the time to hear that voice within. Yeah. It makes me think of just the reaction versus responding and yeah. to respond. Well, I've got to take a moment. I got to be aware of the present, which is just not our propensity, especially if it's an intense situation, an intimate, vulnerable, yeah. we could do another show just on the inner child work. Maybe we'll follow oh, up with that. Yes, that. yes, yes. Health and wellness is the next one. And, you know, I've had some other performers on the show. It's an interesting one for me because you're kind of paid for how you, not so much how you feel, but how you look at least Oh yeah, I mean, is, is a big part of it. And, and I, I am going to be, I'm going to poke a little bit in this. You're professional on stage. I mean, that's been most of your life on stage and, and a dancer as well. Mm. That's a dangerous place to be. Oh, yeah. yeah. So tell me, tell me what you will about that. But oh, I want to, yeah. I want to know then what you're doing now. What is, what are the values? What are you doing for nutrition, exercise, whatnot, but maybe speak to that a little bit too, because I know you've been in a place where you are under a microscope for how you perform, how you look. Oh, it's, I, I I often say that I believe it's one of the hardest industries and some people, there's going to be pushback, of course. Yes. Did I get paid to do what I love? Did I get paid to do my hobby? Yup. But at the same time, you have to understand that you are your only tool, right? As a performer, you're, if you if you can't sing the song, well, you're not going to be able to do your job. If your body's not operating well or, you know, you get an injury, you're out. So your body is your tool. And I saw so many, I mean, especially women develop eating disorders right in front of me. Um, and all of that goes back to once again, you're going to be like, you sound like a broken record, but I have to keep reiterating this. It's that powerful communication within yourself. Because if you as a performer, which is what I was for decades, tie your identity and you tie your self-worth to what that casting director said or them telling you, uh, you know, you could lose a few, you could gain a few, then you're going to be in trouble. But by grounding yourself, and I have to thank my parents for this, for really instilling in me such strong values of, of being true to yourself and loving yourself. Um, if you don't have that and you don't have your feet firmly planted on the ground, it is so easy to go off the rails. Trust me. I can't tell you how many times I was told, yeah, you're too Italian. You're not Italian enough. You're too short. You might want to lose about 10 pounds. Your hair is not the right color. I mean, 
Hmm. Picture what that feels like constantly. It's not talking about your content or, oh, that podcast episode wasn't good. It's like, no, you, your body and your face just isn't working. So it's really tricky. But for me, it was two things. Having strong communication with myself um, and making sure that I was always aware of my own self-worth. And number two, always taking a second to feel my feelings. Mm. When I get that rejection and they'd be like, no, Renee, we don't want you for the show. You're not this enough. Allowing myself to cry or to scream or to be upset. That way I can move through the, the feelings and the emotions to get to the other side. I think oftentimes what I've witnessed, especially being in the business for so long, there's not an awareness of the emotion behind it. There's not a um uh an a per- permission to feel. And then what happens? The more you push those feelings down, it's going to show up somewhere, right. right? So maybe it shows up in some sort of an addiction or it shows up in an eating disorder. So those two things really is what helped me as a performer and now I mean I love to eat. I told you that last time. Like yeah, eating, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's my hot. It's literally my joy. <laughs> like, <laughs> amen. <laughs> amen. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's about eating lots of vegetables, lots of fruits, and enjoying what I eat. So did I, was I just away coaching and we ate at this amazing steakhouse? Did I have steak, truffle mashed potatoes, and then cake to end it? Yes. And a glass of wine, right? But it's about just keeping it in in pers- in perspective, in balance. I always work out. Um, movement to me is medicine. And that became very apparent when I went from living a life of pure physicality, eight shows a week, up and down the subway stairs, dancing in heels, to then being a communication coach and sitting behind a computer. Yeah. I was like, oh, I don't feel right. <laughs> Yeah. So, there's, there's not a lot of thin ex pro cyclist, uh, yeah. either. Yeah. Because you yeah. adopt those eating habits that you can afford back then and not yep. now. So when you were performing though, was that it still, you know, you ate pretty clean for the most part. Uh, ex- I'm not like you, well, you get it right. When you're like burning all those calories, you can get it, away with more, you can get yeah. away with it. You know, you're just kind of doing all, you know, you're like, I just got to get fuel. But now I have such a uh, more of an understanding of like yeah. food and medicine. So I, I just, um, recently did, um, an amazing genetic test from Gary Brecca. And it's basically you like swab your cheek mm-hmm. and it tests your five main pillar genes And it shows you where you have some genetic breaks. We all do. You know, most of us have a genetic break or two. And then he helps to guide you with what supplements to take to supplement for those genetic breaks. And then also talks about like what's good for you to eat and what doesn't serve your body as well. Um, But, you know, I just thought of this this morning, which is so great. We're talking about this. I woke up, I did my meditation and then I journaled as I always do. And I started journaling about this relationship to food, right? Because mm. again, I'm a, I'm like, uh, my, I, I love eating. I, anybody who knows me, they're like, oh God, Renee and eating, that's all she wants to do. Um, but I started thinking about it and I was like, you know, I'm going to stop labeling, oh, I don't want to eat that, that's bad. I want to eat that, that's good. Because what's, if someone says this quote, someone famous, like nothing is good or bad Um, it's just what you attach, like the meaning you attach to it. Right. 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 So I've decided, and I encourage you all to hop on this bandwagon with me, like not labeling, even if you have those French fries, which yes, we are aware it's not the healthiest thing for you, but it's much better to say, you know what? I had some French fries and it served my body and it felt really good as opposed to being like, I can't believe I just ate those French fries. Like I'm such a jerk that doesn't help serve our bodies, you know? And I really believe Speaking of communication, we are always communicating with our cells, with our organs. So mm-hmm. why not like come at it from a positive standpoint? I, I came home from my trip and I was like, you know what? I had lots of cake, some wine, and it tasted so good. And I'm yeah. so happy that I enjoyed those moments. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I, I My show, I think it was just, just um, gosh, it was this week that I talked with uh, Nedra Tawab that I've talked about. And we were talking about this, I think in this segment of the show, 
And I realized that I was trying to be positive, like you're talking about and say, I, I really enjoy and I'm good with my vices. Okay. That was one step, but then she kind of got me to, well, let's, maybe let's not even call them vices. It's still yeah. a negative word. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm tracking, yes. uh, I'm tracking with you. Okay. On the, on the, uh, it's, it's, it's so funny. We continue to, uh, where I think we're kindred spirits here because food, yeah. I was so, <laughs> I, I, so I giggle at myself that I'm always thinking like right now, I know I'm going to pick kids up. I'm going to do this. And I'm thinking, well, where are we going to eat? Yes! Uh, it's kind of like this predominant motivator. That's always there's what I'm going to. Oh gonna, my, Kevin, yeah. you are literally my soul brother. So <laughs> I, I yeah. say the same exact thing. So at breakfast, as I'm eating my breakfast, I'm thinking about what I'm going to have for lunch. Absolutely. And, I catch myself sometimes and I go, do peep, do other people do this or is this just me? So thank you for letting me know it's I'm not all, it's, and, then, and then if it's not food, then it's a beverage. Is it going to be yes. coffee, tea, wine? Is it my electrolyte water something? Yeah, exactly. Th thank you. Yeah, there you go. Okay. On the, I did want to ask on the exercise uh, standpoint, yeah. I think it was on Instagram, on your Instagram account, seeing you doing kind of yoga type stuff, or yeah. is that your, what is your, what is your primary exercise regime now? So, well, dancing is mm. always number one for me. I mean, that's not, I wouldn't say like, that's just my, my full 45 minute workout, but dancing must be incorporated into my day. And I'm, I'm not kidding you guys. I'm talking about even maybe right before I get in, I jump in my cold shower, which I do every day. I'll even like get myself pumped up. I'll put on a song I love and like dance for a little bit before I jump in the cold shower. Awesome. Right. Awesome. Because that is just a part of me. It makes it, it's a part of my spirit, but I love high interval workouts like hit training because mm -hmm. again, I, I like to get in and get out. I'm not one of those people who's like two hours at the gym. I'm like, Nope, let's, let's get her done. Yeah. Um, but I love variety. That's my personality. So as you said, one day I'll be doing HIIT training. The next day I'm like, let's do a yoga workout. Then the next day I'm like, let's, you know, focus on weights. So I, I really like to switch it up. And I think it's great for your body too. So you're not falling into um, a routine where then your body's not able to change because yeah. you used to it. Mind is next. Mind, mental state, mental health. And I'm going to come at you at a different direction. Because I am going to guess that you don't have, in general, a huge problem motivating yourself. You're pretty optimistic. Um, you know how to get yourself up. I mean, you had to. I actually no, that's why. I mean, guys, you had to. So no matter, I appreciate that from a performance standpoint. That when you're in a vocation that requires you to show up fully, you have to show up fully. So it doesn't matter what circumstance happened or to some degree, even what you felt, you're going to get on stage and you got to do it. And there's really not an option not to. So you know how to do that. So I'm going to come at it the opposite way and say, where are you at risk most with your, the mental state you want? What is the thing that you need to take affirmative action towards? Because if anything's going to pull you down, it's going to be X. Oh, yes. So good, Kevin. That's such a good question for me. And I just had awareness around this during the holidays. I have recognized you're a hundred percent right. I never have a problem with motivation. I actually have like this internal motor that sometimes I'm like, Jesus, like, can we, I, I don't need to be doing, doing, doing Yeah. where I can falter is when I'm you know, the holidays, we're so busy. We're here, there, I'm cooking, I'm at this person's house. And even though it's all positive and fun and amazing, it's overwhelming in a way. Right. And that has happened to me all throughout my career too. Like if there's a show coming up and I'm in rehearsal, and I'm in this, I often can get overwhelmed. And then what happens is then my body's like, okay, we're going to get you like under the weather. So you take a moment uh, to stop. Huh. And after Christmas, two days after Christmas, I was running here, running there. And I just like woke up and I was like, I don't feel good. You know, I had a fever and it ended up being COVID. Um, I had, mm. you know, a fever for one night and then pretty much was fine for the rest of the week. But I recognized it where I was like, oh, I didn't take a moment to stop. And also to give myself that space, because as you can see I, i'm a high energy person i love yeah. life like i love people um but i also need that alone time to recharge i need that alone time i'm very reflective i need to journal so if i'm not getting that time to recharge that's when my body's like okay 
we're going to put you in bed for a couple of days because you're not taking a break. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, it's funny. You said, I, I'm just laughing. I, you talked about the holidays and you said, I love life. Um, so, you know, Scrooge, the story of Scrooge yeah. and the, uh, I don't think you can see it here, but back on my bookshelf is a picture of the ghost of Christmas present and that, you know, his song, I like life, yes. life <laughs> likes me. So I, that that's, that's me. And my kids got me this poster with the words, uh, and it's in a frame, uh, back I there and I like, and I see that in you. <laughs> well, the other thing you talked about and you mentioned it, well, we talked about uh, transcendental meditation. So that's another thing that I'm going to assume that, and being as high energy as you do, you see the need to sometimes not yes. and come back and be still. And, and I want to be really vulnerable here. I am. Okay. So I'm doing all this inner child work. It's blowing my mind. I love it. Yeah. And we're also, um, I've also learned about human design. So it, it's amazing, Kevin. you got to look into it. It's based on your birth date, your time of birth, where you were born. And it basically shows you what your design is as a human. And it has been so eye-opening for me because I think myself, like many of you, I often question myself, right? I mean, I, I'm a reflective person. I'll be like, why do I do this thing? Or why is this challenging for me? And when you understand your human design, it shows you, it's just like a blueprint to be like, Renee, you're really creative. You're not the person who's supposed to be like super organized to the detail and the moment. And learning that made me feel a sense of peace because for so long I'd fight against myself and I'd be mm -hmm. like, but why don't I do that thing? So with the inner child work, we've been focusing on human design and it's amazing because what it shows me, I like to call it like a spiritual mirror, mm -hmm. is that I am a deep feeler. So I am a complete empath, you know, which I love. I think it's one of my greatest gifts. Like when, when you're telling me a story, I'm feeling it with you. Like, I'm not just like, oh, I have compassion for you, Kevin. I feel it with you. Um, but with that comes a lot of emotions. So just as much as I feel high energy, I can also feel really low. And, and as I said, I need to cry. I need to get my feelings out. And that's part of my human design. It's literally like she shows me, she's like, see this line here. This is the channel of emotion. So uh -huh. you are meant to feel, she's like, you are meant to feel like the highs of, uh, highs of life and the lows. And that's what makes life worth living, right? Um, but too often we label the low moments bad, mm -hmm. just like food, right? Oh, I shouldn't feel sad or down. Well, why? There's a lot of things in life that cause sadness and for you to feel down. But as long as you're not judging them and you're allowing yourself to feel it, to move through it, that could be your greatest gift, right? And that's how we create... Um, you know, magic from the circumstances we find ourselves in or the emotions we feel. So that's just been really incredible. But I just wanted to be clear, like, I'm not like, oh, I'm just happy all the time. No, like, I feel very sad. I mean, just, just the things that happen looking around at, at just the, the sadness and losing friends and family members and seeing what's going on in our world. No, I feel and there are days that I'm like, ugh, I just want to lay on this couch. Um, but it's important to allow yourself to feel those things as well. Yes. Thank you for repeating what my therapist is telling me because yes. you're right that, that, you know, we can feel the highs, but, uh, man, the lows, I have not Ooh. given credit to the power of those. So that's my therapist literal dictate, sit in it, feel it, sit, sit in, in it. it. Yes. Yeah. yes. Said, don't, don't let it control you and overwhelm you and whatever. We all know no. that, but um, on the other side, I think we, I've gone, you know, I went too far and I think a lot of people do to not feeling them as well. Interesting. Um, work, career, business is next. And in part one, where we talked, I brought out what I really appreciate in you that here you are on this trajectory of Broadway and then the big screen and movies and whatnot. And then you say, I'm ready to activate some other gifts, or as we talked about, transfer some skills yes, yeah. you know, to, to a different, uh, a different thing. So yeah, you find yourself now, and it's been a relatively short period of time, hasn't yeah. it? To wear this life on stage. And now you are different 
skill set, yeah. different, different vehicle, let's say different vehicle. So now you're looking at it and where would you say, okay, right now you're looking at your career, you're looking at your uh, vocation and say, what is my, what is your value right now? Mm. My value is, oof. I mean, this isn't a one word value, but it, I, I have to say it's to, to, share. And what you might ask, am I sharing to share the magnificence of communication to help people to make it a priority in their lives so they can have the lives that they talk about wanting. Hmm. You know, hmm. I think I just, I, I always you know, I write it down, I look at it, I, I speak on it, but creating a communication movement, right? Where people, it's like what we're talking about, Kevin, like where people won't be afraid to be like, yeah, I'm just feeling crappy today. So I'm going to sit in it. Like communicating that instead of just being like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm good. It's like, let's dig a little deeper. How, what do you mean when you say you're fine? Right? Like, like making communication a priority that it's not just a byproduct of life, which is, I believe where we've been thus far in as a culture, as a society. Oh yeah. Communication. It's a byproduct like breathing, but no, making it a priority, just like we make other things in our lives priority, right? Like I often say, I coach a lot of companies universities, organizations. And I, I talk about helping them to create genuine connections with their clients and teams through communication. And I talk about this, this fact that we focus on the apps we have, and we focus on, you know, the, the tactical things in our businesses. And it's like, wait, let's rewind before we get to any of that stuff. How are you communicating? Right. This is a fundamental element in our lives that we must bring to the forefront if we want everything else to work. I am going to, in referencing you, so the book's called, you know, Becoming a Master Communicator. You call yourself a communication, you know, coach. Oh, yep. However, I, not however, in referencing you though, that is what I want to put it there. It's to connect though. It's not just communicating because yes. we can go have a a speech coach or a voice coach, or yeah, you know that you've done it. So we see those and they're going to help you, you know, technically communicate, but you're talking about the connection or yes. the communication of connection, which is a much greater and deeper thing. Look, I'm writing this down. Look, see, I love, I'm forever a student. I'm writing that because I love that you say that because that's what I've been, again, my, my business is fairly new. This is just going on just starting almost three years, very, very new. Mm -hmm. Um, and in that time I was also writing my book at the same time. So it kind of felt like two businesses, but in, um, looking to craft, right. Exactly what I do. Like I've had to verbalize it myself. Cause I'm like, okay, Renee, I am not teaching you high level tactical communication tactics of, you know, exactly, um, how you hold your body to do this. I am teaching you the fundamentals of connecting with other human beings. And yeah, my yeah. book is that way as well, right? Because you're right. There are millions of communication coaches that you can go hire who are going to talk to you about the specifics and the details and get into the weeds about your body language and your this. But I am on the side yeah. of everyday practices and tools that you can use to connect with people on a genuine level. Because at the end of the day, Simon Sinek, Simon Sinek says it, and I love this and I, I refer to it a lot. We don't do business with companies. We do business with people, yeah. right? I'm in the people business. So thank you for saying that, Kevin, because that's really beautifully put. And I'm going to I'm going to use that. It's like, I teach the communication of connection. Yeah. I, that is, I was just, I'm sitting oh, here good. typing it as well and thinking that's not, the, not the communicating. Cause I think we tend to take that word and think communicating is telling and yep. what you're continuing to teach us is, well, it, your primary premise is listening and, but it's a communicating to connect. None of us want to communicate and we don't want to be talked to. We don't want to be told we want to connect and we miss that. Um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you're my master connector, queen connect. We're oh, gonna I play love with that. that. Connection, the connection queen. Um, it is. It's such a gift, Renee. Um, hey, the next one: money, finances, mm. and yes. wealth. When you look at that, uh, you know you've always been in a, you've been in a career where, like you talked about, you have to show up. There's not really any room for excuses. You nope. get paid by how you perform, by how you connect, how you communicate, how you come off. So, um, and I'm sure you've seen ups and downs in your financial finances as time has gone on. So when you look at that now, what would you say? This is what I value for myself financially. Yeah. I look at money as this beautiful resource that allows me to help others in a bigger way. It's like, I love Tony Robbins says this, um, and I may not be quoting it exactly right, but it's basically like, if someone's not going to give you a dollar out of $10, they're not going to give you, you know, a hundred thousand dollars out of a million. Did I say that right? You get my point though, right? Yeah. Yeah. But like basically saying like, you know, if you're a giver, you're a giver. So like for me, you know, donating to, to, to charities and, and not even thinking about it, like that is, that is part of having money of, of being able to, to earn an income. So you can help others in that way. And my husband and I talk about this a lot. Like we are so excited about, you know, getting to this certain level you know, of, of our, our financial, of our, of our, of our finances that we dream of not to just be like, yeah, we're going to buy that boat, but it's like, no, buy the boat to have all of our family and friends come. And then we pay for everybody to go on vacation. Like, I just think that's so beautiful. And for me as well, I'm not the type of person who's like obsessed with money. And like, I look at it just like with the food, right? Like, Oh my gosh, I can't spend a dollar. I want that coffee, but I'm not going to spend the dollar because I have to save. That's not to say I don't budget and I don't have to, you know, I'm not conscious. Well, of especially, money. come on, especially with food, food and drink. Oh you my, don't, you don't you. skip on that. Where if you're going to spend money, that's where you do it. It's, thank you, Kevin. Exactly. So for me, and I was raised that way too, right? Yeah. Like my Italian mother and father, when I first went on tour, they're like, never neglect yourself. If you got to <laughs> eat that meal, you eat it and you get your dessert too. Like, so I, I that's, that's what's great. ingrained in me. And I've noticed again, with the whole perspective and energy of the words you use and how you look at things times in my life. And I'm not kidding times in my life that I've tried to be emulate. I have friends of mine who are very thrifty and they'll be like, no, I can't get that pen. Cause it's five ninety five. I'm going to get the pen. That's five seventy five. Like mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. frugal, I've tried to emulate that and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to spend that extra bubba. I'm telling you, Kevin, that's when more money goes out. When I live the way that feels good to me, where I'm like, you know what? I want that iced coffee. I'm going to spend the $3 because that's going to make me happy and feel good. Money comes to me. So for me, that's how I look at finances. It's just another element of life that can be fun. Yes, do, am I conscious of saying like, okay, but I need to make sure I'm earning as Earl Nightingale says, right? Um, money. You're not successful when you make money, you're successful. And then money comes as a byproduct. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's so true and spot on. And yeah, the finances to me are, are another exchange of energy and it's about the way you look at it. And for me, I choose to look at finances and money in a really positive way. I'm interested in a tangible aspect of you having spent most of your career on stage on Broadway, yeah. doing that pretty much getting paid for the performance. Is there a perspective that you're aware of now or going towards now where you'd like to make some residual income? Cause I assume that there's not any there that's you're paid while you're on stage. Maybe you're paid well, but when it ends, yeah. it ends, it's over. That's kind of the artist perspective oh, yeah. financially anyways. And now you're looking at something, I mean, right here, I'm holding your, you know, your book that can sell yeah. forever. You can have, you know, you know, the deal, you can have courses, you can have whatever you get speaking and stuff, but you can have some money happening, coming in residually long-term without it just being, so is that a significant shift for you? Without a doubt. I mean, it's really interesting just since in these past few years, did it, did I really start understanding like what passive income is? Right. Cause right. I I never had that. It's like I work and I get paid and 
And even with that, I mean, talk about a, an unstable career. I could be on top of the world starring in a Broadway show. The show closes the next day. I'm looking for the next job. So yeah. that's what I mean. Like, even though, again, I, I look at money freely, I still was very smart to like save money while I was working. Right. But now, yes, honestly, passive income is is a big priority in my life right now. And that's, you know, in the development of my business and as a, as I'm growing in that aspect, having those those, you know, th things that allow money to come in while I'm sleeping, that's really important. And I think that's, I think that's important for all of us, right? Because the, the world's changing, things are getting more expensive. Yeah. <laughs> we need to think about those things. Yeah, totally. You know, this last one here, and uh, you'll be the second person I've done this with since Robert Waldinger. So I had him on the show and we were talking about this last category and asking about the things that he does, that he does just for him, kind of self-care. And he said, oh, like the things that I do that give me energy? Yes, that's a better way. So I'm reformatting. So I did it with Nedra Tawab a couple of days ago, and I'll do that with you. This last spoke, which is kind of like the personal area, but that's what I'm looking for. What are the things that you do, whether they're self-care, whether they're hobbies, whether their interests, whatever, that really give you energy, understanding that, you know, what you, you're blessed to do, like you said, your work as a hobby, you know, has been that you love that it gives you energy, but the things that you do really in a more non-productive mm. aspect, you know, like even you talking about, man, I'm gonna take a minute and dance. And then you're not thinking about exercise. <laughs> you're thinking about just dancing, you know, right. That's just, it's not, it's not, you're not getting paid at that point. Uh, it's just something you do for you. So along those lines, somewhat maybe non-productive doesn't have to be, but that yes. you do for you gives Renee energy. Number one, dancing. As I okay. said, I mean, I, every day, as I told you before I jump in the cold shower, I'm dancing it out. Same thing, singing, Singing for me is such a release for me. Um, I mean, in the car, I let, I mean, you have a free concert if you come drive with me because I'm singing. <laughs> okay. okay. You know, I just, because I realize again, I, I explained, you know, I, I went through a lot within, you know, the past two and a half, three years. And I realized that when I wasn't singing or dancing, it was like stuck energy within me. So singing allows that release. Uh, writing, journaling, huge for me. Poetry. I write a lot of poetry. I write, um, I wrote all my nieces and nephews, personalized children's books. So wow. they're children's books based on them, you know, but it's basically a big, long poem, but it's all tied to them and their personality traits. Um, and the last one is having that connection with my family and friends. So like I mm. kind of started this little tradition with my mother-in-law and my father-in-law who live luckily like a mile from us. And one morning I was like, Michael, to my husband, I was like, let's just go to, to mama and papa's and like, let's just go have coffee Sunday morning. And that's what we do. We get up at like 7.30 on Sunday. We, we go over there, we have coffee talk, we connect mm. and it, literally lights me up from the inside out. So when I say, I don't say this lightly, when I say being in person, especially with the people I love or people who um, uh, are a reflection of what I want to be or who inspire mm. me, when I'm around people like that physically, mm. it is as if my spirit is lit up from the inside. So that's something I do for myself and it just makes me happy. We've also been going there to watch Yellowstone because we love that show. Um, but it's this just beautiful, just for myself. Like, I'm like, I want to go see them. I miss them. I want to hug them. Let's go. I don't think I've admitted this to hardly anyone, but I love Yellowstone. I, I haven't watched it with anyone. I've literally, I watched it by myself. So I do these getaways a, a lot, <laughs> just solo getaways. I got a big family. So I'll go on a getaway yeah. and uh, a glass of wine or two and yeah. watching that. I get the feels like, yes. I don't know what it is. Okay. Oh, All right. God, that's, so that's, it, that's so interesting. You mentioned that. Okay. I did want to know too, though, uh, singing, what's the last song you remember belting out in the car, or wherever you are? Um, If you think that I, Literally an hour before we were together, I was in the car with my mom because we went to breakfast. We always do that. <clears throat> and I was singing. Um, okay. I was singing uh, someone to watch over me, you know, the standard because mm -hmm. I just sang it. I was in Milwaukee coaching and one of my fellow coaches, it was his 45th birthday. And we go to this amazing steakhouse called Moe's in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And there's a piano player. So he was like, can you sing for my birthday? And I sang 
someone to watch over me. So I sang it and I was singing it in the car because it was in my head. Give me a line. All right. Um, There's a somebody I'm longing to see. I hope that he turns out to be someone to watch over me. Thank you. I can't end the show any better than that. (laughs) Renee, what a gift. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing your head and your heart. And uh, it's been a gift to be with you, to commune with you, to get to know you. Thank you for sharing this message. I'm so stoked to give it to the audience, though it will never be as great a value as I just feel myself for having heard what you have to offer. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been a gift.